Good morning, everybody. Here we are again. Another week has passed. I don't know about where you are, but uh, here in Oklahoma City, it is uh, downright cold. <laughs> Not near as bad as it is north of here, though. I know. I know you people, Kansas City North, of just going north from there, it's bitter, bitter cold. But it's cold here. <laughs> So cold that all the people didn't want to get out and go to church, so the pastor had to cancel the service for today. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I'm at my homestead doing our lesson today, right? And uh, I'm not using the camera on my computer because for some reason it likes to just fade in and out. Uh, I need to go back to the old camera, I guess. But uh, so I'm just using my phone again, okay? Anyway, today we'll be back in Genesis. This time we're going to be in chapter 8 with Noah leaving the ark. The flood is over. As always, let's open with a word of prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you so much for all your blessings. So many things we don't know, we don't understand. We don't know why it happened the way it happened. But uh, it's all in your plan. We can trust you. Thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for Jesus, without whom we would be so lost. Be with your spirit. May your spirit be with us now as we open and study your word that you can speak to each and every one of us individually. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Genesis chapter 8. Right? Now, if you remember... Last week, we were talking about, you know, the flood, right? We had Noah and his family and all the animals, two by twos, etc. cetera, you know, get on the, get on the ark. It took Noah 100 years to build, assuming he and his family worked on it together. It still was a 100-year project. And when he was all done, God said, okay, it's time. And the rain started. The floods came, the waters from under the earth, the waters from above the earth, that all came down and flooded the entire earth and to the point that every mountain was covered at least 20 feet. Okay? And everything that wasn't in the ark died. Well, now we have Noah and his family in the ark, right? It says in the last verse of 7, verse 24, And the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So for five months, right? They're just in the ark floating around. Nothing but water. Not only as far as the eye can see, as far as there was. <laughs> Everything was underwater. Chapter 8, verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all of the beasts and all of the cattle that were with him in the ark and God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. All right. Hey, you have to wonder after all that time, did Noah feel forgotten? <laughs> you know, in the ark all that time and <laughs> what's going on? All right. There are times that God leaves us to ponder you know, after, what was it, Malachi, and then there's no prophet in Israel until John the Baptist, and that was 400 years. You have to think that uh, they felt somewhat abandoned by God, right? No one may have been wondering about him. His family may have been wondering. The animals were probably wondering what's going on, <laughs> right? But God didn't forget them, right? And guess who's in control? The Lord God, right? Anyway, God controlled the water. It says, and the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained, and the water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. And in the seventh month, 
on the 17th day of the month. Isn't it interesting that God tells us with such specificity, you know, because uh, you remember Noah was 600 years old, and in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day that all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened, right? Tell us exactly what day it was, right? Now he's telling us exactly what's going on here, okay? The ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, which mountain in the mountains of Ararat? We don't know, right? I know there's a lot of people say they found the ark in Turkey because there's a mountain called Ararat in Turkey. I don't think the ark rested in Turkey because we know that civilization, as it repopulated, basically came from the valley, right, where Babylon is, right? So I think it rested just north of there in the mountains up in that region. The gospel according to Larry. <laughs> The seventh month and seventeenth day, the ark rested, and the water decreased steadily until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. So the water is receding, right? But we're talking now another three months there in the ark, and the water's now down where they can see the tops of mountains, right? If Mount Everest was 29,000 feet at the time, it would have been visible, but they're too far away <laughs> to have seen it, right? But they're seeing the mountains around them. The mountaintops are becoming visible now, right? And the water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the, in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the top set of mountains became visible. Then it came about at the end of 40 days, isn't it interesting how often God uses 40 days? <laughs> so many things take 40 days in the Bible. And there's so many. But at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Okay? Now, that's probably not the first time. If he saw the top of the mountains. Right? It might be the first time. But I would guess he had opened the window since it wasn't raining. Right? And he was looking for a sign of anything other than just water as far as you could see right but he opened the window right and he sent out a raven and it flew here and there until the water was dried up it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth the ravens out flying around okay and he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. Okay. He sent out a dove, but the dove found no resting place for the sole of her feet. So she returned to him into the ark. For the water was on the surface of the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. Why did God tell us that the dove goes out, doesn't find any place to light, comes back, Noah puts out his hand, and the dove rests on his hand. Why do you think God put that message in there? Is he saying that we're kind of like that and we need to come to him? We don't have any resting place without God? Right? I don't know just seems like that kind of symbolism to me because we don't I mean we are totally lost without God you know without Jesus and his sacrifice we're doomed right we know that okay but it's interesting the little things that God puts in the Bible when you read it But the dove found no resting place. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Okay, that's who he did that one. Let's go down to verse 10. So he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew 
that the water was abated from the earth. So there's now places where things are starting to grow, you know, above the ground, right? The water is abating, is receding. We're now getting bare ground and, and growth starting to happen, right? Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove and she did not return to him. Hmm. She now found a place, right? You know, and didn't need to be there anymore. I had a note from this little special page of my Bible I wrote at the top. I wonder if Noah had hired any help to help build the ark. And if he did, why didn't they get in? <laughs> you know? But who knows? We don't know. That That's just total speculation. Right? Now, we know that <clears throat> the dove didn't come back. Noah knows things are happening, right? But what did Noah do? What did he do? Did he run outside? He waited. He waited for God to give him instruction. Right? It came about in the 601st year right, of his life. In the first month, the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. You remember, there was, he built a top on it and there was an 18 inch window, right? Well, now he's taking this top off. So now we have a convertible <laughs> version of the ark, right? And he's able to see all around, not just out the window, right? He's able to see all around. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. The sec second month, the 27th day of the month. So he is one year and 10 days, right? One year and 10 days in the ark. Think about that. One year and 10 days, he's in the ark, his family, and the animals. And now when the wind's blowing, drying up all the, the waters, right? The odors in the ark probably were a lot less. <laughs> when the wind stopped, you know, it may not have smelled so good in that ark, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, on the second month, 27th day, God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Now, this is interesting, the way God words this. You and your wife and your sons and their wives, right? Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, the birds, animals, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. All y'all get out of the boat, <laughs> right? It's time. So Noah went out and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, the whole family. And every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, and everything that moves upon the earth went out by their families. By their families. Right? From the ark. Isn't it interesting? That even the animals, God describes their behavior by family. You know, the core structure of society is the family, right? He says, they all came out by their families, right? And then, what did Noah do? He just got out of the ark. One year, ten days in the ark, right? And he just got out. What did he do? Dance, <laughs> right? Is he jumping up and down? Verse 20. Then Noah 
built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Okay, now, we know Noah is not perfect. He's not like Jesus. He's not sinless. He builds an ark, an ark, an altar. And by the way, this is the first reference to an altar being built. Were there altars before? Maybe. We don't know. We have no reference to an altar being built before. Now we have one being built. Now, was it made of rock? Was it made of mud? Was it a combination? We don't know. Right? But you remember the altar that was put in the tabernacle, right? You know, of stone and where they sacrificed the animals. Many, 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 many animals, right? Well, he sacrificed. Now, did he have a lot of extra animals? <laughs> no. And they all came out I was just thinking, they all came out after being confined. Did they just wander around with Noah? Or did they, any, any of them just kind of take off? <laughs> right? You know? But bottom line, God made it available. Just like God put the animals in the ark. God kept the animals available to Noah so he could make this sacrifice. Noah put God first. Not his necessities. He didn't build a house. Right? He built an altar. He put God first. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. We're not really much different, are we? You know, there might have been some other influences before the flood that made things even worse, and thus the necessity of wiping out everybody, which is what obviously what God did. We don't know. But we know that it says here that the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. He said, I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. Now, it's interesting, the Lord says, you know, that he could smell the smoothing aroma, you know. They call that an aphrom, aphrom what do they call it, aphromorphic? <laughs> Applying human characteristics to God so he could say he could smell it, right? You know, but point being is that the obedience of Noah, Noah putting God first, was pleasing to God, right? We have this several times in, in the Bible. I find it all amazing that Noah, you know, waited another two months <laughs> to get out of the ark. I can imagine they were in a hurry. He was in a hurry. The family was in a hurry. The animals were in a hurry. Everybody wanted off the boat, I'm sure, right? You know, after a year. But he waited two more months before he finally exited based on God's instructions and then demonstrates his appreciation. As you remember, everybody else was gone. There was nobody else. You know, and we have legends in other cultures that talk about, you know, similar things. There was a worldwide flood and the gods killed everybody, right? You know, well, if that was the case, then how'd everybody get back, right? <laughs> and there's a, one that has a, a god, a character like Noah, but he was divine, right? He was a god, <laughs> You know, well, okay, and then the boat landed, and now you have a God walking on the earth. Where's the people? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, people have taken Noah's story. They try to say that the Noah's story is copied from their legend, but it's the other way around. Right? This is the word of God right here. This is the story. 
it's interesting that God goes on to say, while the earth remains, while the earth remains, that means the earth will not always remain. Okay? We know we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. It talks about it in Revelation 21, 22. But while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. All right? But there will be an end to this earth as we know it. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Right? The new Jerusalem, which is kind of like a glass thing, right? You know, I forget the, what it's actually made of, but it's you see through and the glory of God in the center of it is what lights everything up. And it's 1,500 miles cube. <laughs> 1,500 miles, east and west, right? You know, length, width, and height. But anyway, it's interesting that uh, God tells us that while the earth remains, things are going to move on as they normally do, right? And we're going to find out some other things about the changes in the weather and diet and stuff like that that happened now that Noah is <clears throat> after the flood, right? Which is kind of interesting also, of course, in the Bible is probably pretty interesting, right? <laughs> God's word. You know. But that's the story of Noah exiting the ark. Right? Then he builds an altar, which the purpose of that is to make atonement for their sin. I don't know how much sin they did on the ark. <laughs> Maybe it was all up here, you know, where Larry commits most of his sin, right? And later on, we have the ark, you know, and we have atonement, which comes from obedience. You know, when we're obedient to God, and in today's world, we have Jesus. So our obedience is just accepting the free gift of God, the sacrifice that he made, and <clears throat> that we can have eternal life. Right? Jesus made that sacrifice for us. That's how our sins are atoned for. The blood of Jesus Christ. Not of animals. Of God himself. God sacrificed himself for our sin. Right? Always blows my mind, you know, that God would make such a sacrifice to do what he did, demonstrates his love for us. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, Father in heaven, again, I just thank you for all you've done. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your lessons. And I'd like to say again that if anybody doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, may your spirit be able to reach them today. Convict them of their need for Jesus, have their sins forgiven, and they would accept him into their life as their personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your lessons. Thank you for your love and your sacrifice. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's our lesson in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 8 today. I'll see you next week, probably on Genesis chapter 9. <laughs> God bless.